Our featured speaker tonight is one of the uh, has been such a gift to the Civil War Roundtable of Gettysburg. Uh, Wayne Mott's first presented uh, to our group in 1991. I believe this was his eighth or ninth uh, presentation. Most recently, uh, he was with us in, I believe it was October of 2018. And some of you read in the uh, latest e-communication, that happened to be my first night at the, uh, in attending the Civil War Roundtable of Gettysburg. And I'm really not much of a joiner, had um, seated myself in the back row. And, but between the uh, hospitality of Glenn Heller and the, the great uh, surroundings at the GAR Hall and the terrific program Wayne put together, I thought, you know, I might like to come back and be part of this. It worked out. Uh, Wayne, as, as many of you know, is the uh, CEO of the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg. Uh, Jim Hessler had written the book on Pickett's Charge, wonderfully illustrated, uh, make a great Christmas gift. And uh, we, we were uh, a little concerned with the pandemic, would, would Wayne want to go ahead and present tonight? And we are so glad that he has consented to do so. And with that, I will turn things over to our good friend, Wayne Mott. Yay! <laughs> uh, uh, well, well, thanks a lot. I appreciate that, Bruce. I'm going to start this up. And I didn't realize, I'm sitting right next to my furnace in my house, so I'm hoping that I don't have to run upstairs, Pete, and turn that off if everybody's listening. Uh, I can't thank Bruce. I can't thank you enough. I can't thank Roger, all the folks at the round table for many, many years. I wish I had my curls back that you had for that picture in 1991, Bruce. Uh, and my nephew says that when Pete put out the um, Facebook event where it says his place was clearly in the insane asylum, my picture, of course, was right above that. So he was seriously questioning how I put that whole thing together. I guess I should have changed the title uh, from the beginning. But uh, this is a great story. And it's often practice for me to give a dedication, which I want to do. First of all, in the slide, the name of the person we're going to talk about, Samuel Sproul, that's on the left-hand side of your screen, his father, William T. Sproul. And then... That is on the right hand side of this slide is the regimental crest of the 4th United States Infantry Regiment. That's the unit that fought at Gettysburg that this man was part of. It was U.S. Grant's unit during the time of the battle. Uh, 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 of course, at Gettysburg, it fights here. It's Grant's unit in the 1850s. And there's a white Maltese cross on the regimental crest of the 4th Infantry today from the Civil War. So there's a lot of history here. And I'm really looking forward to giving this presentation because it's unusual. I love stories, and I love something that hasn't been done before, and that's the case here. Um, let me see if I can get it shared. There we go. I want to dedicate it tonight uh, in memory of honor of all those people working in the medical field. I think this is very appropriate for what we're going to talk about this evening. This is a picture of Camp Letterman taken in 1863. There is a whole front line of folks that were working here after the Battle of Gettysburg, and there's a whole front line of folks working now in the current crisis this country's in, taking care of body and mind. This presentation not only is about a soldier officer that fights here at Gettysburg, but it also has a mental health component to it. And I have a friend on this call. I promise not to call my friend out. But without that friend, this presentation would not have been possible because I had to get educated on mental health issues related to the Civil War and related today. And without this friend, I would not have been able to do that. You can know everything there is to know about the Civil War. This case also has a mental health component. There are people out there with mental health needs today. There were people that had mental health needs during the Civil War. The medical surgical history of the Civil War has 2,000 people 
that the federal surgeons diagnosed with insanity. Over 2,000 people during the Civil War and they recorded at least 80 deaths from that cause. Now I don't believe that's what happens in this case but we're going to talk a little bit more about it. So uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow we've got a lot of people working to help us on every front and I want to dedicate that uh, this program to them this evening. I came across this story by reading the letters of Dr. Daniel Britton. They're published in the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography in 1965. Dr. Britton was the 11th Army Corps surgeon at the George Spangler Farm, which today is preserved by the Gettysburg Foundation. And this story is not in Ron Kirkwood's book. Uh, if you haven't read Ron Kirkwood's book, Too Much for Human Endurance, about the history of the George Spangler Farm, uh, issued in 2019, you need to pick it up because it is a great book. And I know Ron saw this passage, but he did not highlight this story because he's got so many that he could highlight, so I'm going to do that here this evening. But I came across this July 5th letter written by Captain Britton, uh, uh, Daniel Britton, I'm sorry, the surgeon, and it says Captain Sproul of the United States Infantry. It doesn't say who he is, what unit he's in, and I went to Francis Heitman, the Historical Register of Officers, and was able to find a name of Samuel Mills Sproul, S-P-R-O-L-E, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, so it's not spelled right here, uh, identifying and researching who this person is. He is a regular Army officer. Uh, what's one of the biggest monuments on the Gettysburg battlefield that everybody passes that nobody talks about? It's a monument to the United States regulars. This monument was dedicated by President William Howard Taft on Memorial Day in 1909, and according to the newspaper, some 30 to 40,000 people were here for the dedication of this monument. That's twice the size of the Gettysburg Address, ladies and gentlemen, two times the size of the people that came. There were about 7,100 regular soldiers here in the Battle of Gettysburg fighting, and before the Civil War, the whole regular army was only about 16,000 men. It was expanded during the Civil War. And here at Gettysburg, the regulars had about 1,400 casualties, about 20% of their number, which is not an insignificant number. So the story I'm going to tell you tonight revolves around the regulars fighting in the wheat field on July 2nd, 1863. This monument's 85 feet tall. The New York Monument's taller and the PA Monument is taller, but I think this is like the third tallest monument on the Gettysburg Battlefield, and it's one that hardly anybody ever talks about it, and it's in memory and commemoration of the regular Army units that fight in the Battle of Gettysburg. This is Captain Samuel Mills Sproul, the subject of our talk this evening. This is the only known photograph of him that I've been able to find so far. It's in a 1902 history of Long Island, so this photograph was taken right at the turn of the century. Captain Sproul, I'm going to give you just a little rundown of him, and then we're going to talk, obviously, about his activities at Gettysburg. was born in 1839. He happens to be born in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, only 28 miles north of the Gettysburg battlefield. His father was a Presbyterian minister of note. As Bruce would say, he's a PK, a preacher's kid. Uh, here. His mother was Elizabeth Pyle of Philadelphia, and I'm not going to read all this, but just understand that Captain Sproul moves around because of the parishes that his father is assigned to. So he spends his early life at Carlisle. Who is at Carlisle Barracks in 1840 when this man is a year old? None other than Richard Stoddard Yule. So his father would have known a lot of military officers. Then his father goes down to Washington, D.C. We're going to talk a little bit about that, gets a parish there, then he goes on to West Point, then up to Newburgh, New York, and all the early life of this man that we're going to talk about this evening, Samuel Mills Sproul, was uh, held at West Point. All his early life is at West Point, and he got to know many people there, along with his father, very well. He's commissioned in the 4th Infantry in 1861 as a civilian, so the Civil War breaks out, the Army needs more officers than uh, are being produced at West Point, so you can get a civilian commission, and of course you can be commissioned from the ranks during the time of the American Civil War. But this man gets a civilian commission, 
His father, as I mentioned, a very prominent Presbyterian minister. We're going to talk a little bit about his career because it's important to the history of our story. Born in Baltimore, Maryland, William Spruill, the father of our subject, uh, actually went to Princeton University. He was ordained a minister as a Presbyterian and held some prominent posts. And I'm going to go through them because our subject, Samuel Mill Spruill, this is where he's going to grow up at these different places. This is the original church building in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I believe it's the place where he was baptized. I need to go in and check some records there. It's a 1757 building. And from 1839, March 24th, the day of his birth, Samuel Spruill's father will be the pastor at this church until 1843 when he's assigned to the First Presbyterian Church down in Washington, D.C. Now that church doesn't exist anymore. It would be on the grounds where the Capitol Complex is today. Um, but this parish dates very old prior to the Civil War and it's still around today in the northern part of the city. William Spruill, the father of Samuel Spruill, becomes a minister at this church in 1843. Now who is elected president in 1844? James Knox Polk of Tennessee and what religious denomination is President Polk? Guess what? He's a Presbyterian. Guess where he goes to church? In this church. So there's also members of Congress that go to church here and one of them at one time happens to be Jefferson Davis. Now, William Thomas Spruill gets an appointment to West Point to be the chaplain there because James Knox Polk, the President of the United States, happens to be a parishioner here at this particular church. Spruill gets assigned to West Point. This is the original chapel at West Point. My father may be on the call. This is my father standing down here at the time that the Battlefield Guides went last November, November 2019. Not this previous November, but the November before we went on a guided tour. And William Thomas Spruill is appointed chaplain of the United States Military Academy. He's there from 1847 to 1856. All of the formative years of Samuel Mills Spruill will be here at the United States Military Academy. And it's fascinating because when Jefferson Davis becomes... Secretary of War in 1856, he will have the father of our subject removed as the chaplain at West Point. And I normally don't like to read things, but I want to read to you from the obituary of William Thomas Spruill, the father of our subject, about the fight he has with Jefferson Davis. And when Jefferson Davis becomes Secretary of War, he, because of these, this personal relationship, has William Thomas Spruill removed. Uh, as the chaplain at West Point. Dr. Spruill and Jefferson Davis, and when the latter became Secretary of War, the minister was removed. It appears that the uh, between the two gentlemen first arose, this would be the conflict between the, the gentlemen first arose, uh, when Spruill was the charge of the church's pastor and Jefferson Davis was in the United States Senate. What the quarrel between the two gentlemen was about is not stated, but Mr. Davis is reported to have said to Dr. Spruill that if he was not, if it was not for his white necktie, if it was not for his white necktie, he would give the preacher a sound thrashing. At this remark, Dr. Spruill took off uh, he, in a twinkle of an eye his necktie from his throat and told Mr. Davis he was ready for it. Now, the two of them did not get into a fist fight, but this relationship will end the career of William Thomas Spruill at the United States Military Academy. And if you're Samuel Mills Spruill, the 4th Infantry, your early education, all of your early education is at West Point, and your tutors are all the professors at West Point. He knew all of them personally here. And when he gets a commission in the United States Army in 1861, Samuel Spruill will go to Washington armed with letters of recognition, or, uh, sorry, letters of recommendation from the professors at West Point. So he's got a great educational system. He actually tries to get appointed to West Point, Samuel Spruill does, but since his father is the chaplain, the only appointment he can get is not through the Congress, but through the president, and the president has 10 of those. They're called at-large appointments. 
and he is not able to secure one. So Samuel Mills Sproul, from the time that he is about seven years old to the time he is 17 years old, he is at the United States Military Academy when his father then gets a church in Newburgh, New York, about 12 miles up the Hudson River north after he's removed from West Point. And Dr. Sproul will have a home there. That home doesn't exist any longer, but we know the address of where it was. Here's an image of it, 67 grand at Newburgh, New York. This is where Samuel Sproul lived before he was commissioned into service when he was a young man, up to the time he was 21, we believe. And also when he's commissioned into service, when he gets ill, he'll come back to this place uh, right here. So in 1861, this young man wants to be uh, he, he wants to be a military officer. Now, I'm going to show you the other church that the minister preaches at. This is where his father preached. This is where, and this is still standing in Newburgh, New York. This is a $43,000 church built in Newburgh, New York in 1858. So once the Civil War breaks out, Samuel Sproul now has an opportunity to get a commission. And armed with letters from his tutors at West Point, he will go to Washington, D.C., he will get a commission in May of 1861, and he will be assigned as a second lieutenant in the 4th United States Infantry Regiment. And his first posting is at Governor's Island, New York. This is an illustration and etching in 1846 of the post called Fort Columbus. Later it's called Fort J. That's what it's called today. And this is where he will report to duty on May 22nd, 1861, right after his commission. There are 600 recruits here. This is a mustering station for the beginning of the Civil War. And two officers known to everybody on this call, when Samuel Mills Sproul arrives here as a new 2nd Lieutenant in the 4th Infantry, are here the day he shows up at this post. And they are none other than Samuel Wiley Crawford, who fights in the wheat field, who's the surgeon at Fort Sumter, guess where he is in May of 1861? He's at Fort Columbus, New York. And the other officer here that everybody on this call probably knows, fought here at Gettysburg, uh, and a member uh, of the Confederate Army commanding a division on Culp's Hill is none other than Edward Allegheny Johnson. Edward Johnson is an officer in May of 1861 stationed at Fort Columbus, New York. And he doesn't leave the Army or leave this post until June of 1861. A Confederate officer at Gettysburg, a Union officer at Gettysburg, and Samuel Mills Sproul, who's the second lieutenant in the 4th United States Infantry, promoted almost immediately to first lieutenant. And then in 1862, he will become captain of the 4th Infantry Regiment. A regiment that's been around since 1808, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, still around today, U.S. Grant's Regiment in the 1850s. Many prominent officers, members of the 4th Infantry. Now, Samuel Sproul is a captain by 1862. He will spend a year on general recruiting service doing paperwork in recruiting and disbursement in New York City. He will come back to Fort Columbus, New York, and he will be here until February 1863. He gets commissioned in May. So I'm telling you all of this because this particular officer, who's a captain in the 4th Infantry that we're going to mention at Gettysburg here in a few minutes, never serves a day with his regiment in the field in the two years that he holds a commission. He's here for most of that time. He tries to apply to get into the field. And finally, he gets orders to join his regiment on the Rappahannock River in February of 1863, and he gets ill. He tries several times to get to his unit, and he is not able to do it because he becomes ill. Now, one of these um, um, letters that we have, and we've got a file on this at the National Archives, that's where most of the source material comes from, tells us that he had a fever, he might have had some sort of temporary derangement. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But he is very ill, and he says in a personal statement against his physician's advice, he joins his regiment, and he finally gets there in June of 1863. So on June 10th, about three weeks before the Battle of Gettysburg, he is going to show up with his regiment in the 4th Infantry, and he, ladies and gentlemen, is the senior officer there. So he's supposed to take command of the 4th Infantry, and he's never served a day in the field with them. 
Now, George Sykes is the commanding officer of the division before General Meade is elevated. Remember, George Meade's commanding officer, 5th Army Corps. Then George Sykes, who becomes the commanding officer of the Corps. He's the division commander when Samuel Sproul shows up. And the brigade commander, who later becomes the division commander of the brigade, is Roman Ayers, West Point graduate. These two men don't know quite what to do with Captain Sproul because he shows up uh, with his unit on June 10th and he basically tells Roman Ayers, the brigade commander, look, I'm not fit for duty. I can't command the unit, even though he's the senior officer. So Ayers says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 10 days to go around and learn the duties that you need to do and you do not have to command the 4th Infantry Regiment. It's got about 173 men in it on the eve of the Battle of Gettysburg. It's very small, doesn't have all its companies. And Ayers gives him basically 10 days to learn his assignment. At the end of 10 days, on the 20th of June, 1863, outside Aldi, Samuel Sproul tells Roman Ayers, look, I can't take command. I'm not physically or mentally able to do it. And he will write out a retirement letter on the 20th of June, 1863, to be retired from military service. Now, he hasn't served a day with his regiment in the field. Who has to get that? It's got to go up the chain of command. So, it goes to Roman Ayers. Ayers forwards it and approves it, and he sends it to George Sykes. George Sykes says, look, this man's never served a day in the field with his unit. I don't think he deserves to be on the retirement list. And then it goes up to guess who? It's going to go up to the Corps commander, which is George Meade, and George Meade says, I agree, he shouldn't be on the retirement list. Then it goes up to General Hooker, and General Hooker says, I agree, he shouldn't be on the retirement list. This is all around the 23rd of June, about a week before the Battle of Gettysburg. But now it's got to go to the War Department. The War Department has to take action on this. So basically, Captain Sproul is with his regiment at Gettysburg. He's the senior officer in the 4th United States Infantry Regiment, and he cannot command it. So according to the official records, he is unassigned traveling with his regiment, fighting in the wheat field as an unassigned officer. Now, this you probably know the movements coming up to the Battle of Gettysburg. This regiment goes to Union Mills, uh, Maryland. Uh, that's south of Gettysburg. Then it goes over to Hanover, Pennsylvania. And on July 1st, it's going to leave Hanover and march on the Hanover Road, Route 116, heading west toward Gettysburg from Hanover, Pennsylvania, 15 miles east of Gettysburg. And this is an original 1872 map of the route of Ayers, and I'm going to show you a couple different maps of how they got to the battlefield. Captain Sproul, even though he's a captain, he should be walking. You're a major, lieutenant colonel, colonel, you get to ride. You're a staff officer, you get to ride. You're a general, you get to ride. You're a captain or a lieutenant, everybody, you got to walk. But Captain Sproul says in one of his accounts, he has a horse. Because he says he's been ill, he's riding a horse, he's able to keep up with the troops. And so this is the march, and where it says Newville... That is the town of Bonneville, five miles east of Gettysburg today. These troops will stay around Bonneville. They will get up at about 4 a.m. in the morning on July 2nd, 1863, and they will start their march west uh, to Gettysburg. Now, there's two possible approaches they use. You can go out and drive this today. We don't know which one it is. It could be the Low Dutch Road. It's right here. Or, ladies and gentlemen, look at Lake Heritage today. There was a road that actually went right through what is now Lake Heritage that went to the Baltimore Pike that does not exist today. It's off here where my cursor is. So if you're the 5th Union Army Corps, you're Joshua Chamberlain, you're these troops, you've got two basic approaches that you can use. The Low Dutch Road or this road that went right through what is now Lake Heritage. Here's Lake Heritage today. Cut off the road. I've got the movement here shown on Low Dutch Road. And these troops are going to come in on the morning of July 2nd, 1863, Captain Sproul in tow. And they're going to be south of Gettysburg, right next to McAllister Mill, where the famous, what is it today? The famous former McDuffer's golf course. All of you have played golf down there. It's now part of the, <laughs> it's now part of the American Battlefield Trust. This is, what, this is where they camped out 
or where the batch elder troop position map show the 5th Army Corps on the morning of July 2nd, 1863. And this is at about 9 a.m. in the morning. Granite Schoolhouse Lane, the George Spangler Farm, little round top is down off to the, to the extreme left corner of your map. And that little yellow arrow over here on the right is the approach. Now, the 5th Corps has got how many men? Almost 11,000 troops, ladies and gentlemen, almost 11,000. And here are the three divisions. And on a map for John Batchelder, a government historian, this is where he shows that they will bivouac or they will be resting prior to go to Little Round Top. Ayers his division in the woods right across from where the George Spangler Farm, which is the 11th Union Army Corps Hospital, is today. This is a modern photograph of that intersection. I'm standing where the old McDuffers golf course is, where the sun is off to the right of the image is Powers Hill, artillery position for the 12th Union Army Corps. This is Blacksmith Shop Road and McAllister Mill Road right here to the left of the slide. And this is the Baltimore Pike, main thoroughfare for the Union Army during the Battle of Gettysburg, right in front of you. And the 5th Corps would have come from the left of this slide into the right of this slide. And somewhere where the red arrow is, is where Ayers, Captain Sproul, and the members of the 5th Union Army Corps, the division, the second division of the 5th Corps, will be resting before they get orders to go over to Little Round Top. Between 4 and 5 o'clock, they're going to get orders, move over toward Little Round Top on July 2nd. And I put together, by the way, these are my own maps. These are based on the Cope crop map, which is the Warren base. These will differ a little bit from um, the maps, uh, Phil Lano's maps. It'll differ from that. This will be close to probably Timothy J. Reese's book on Sykes' regular division, which was released by McFarland Press in 1990. That's really the definitive history of the regulars fighting down here. You can buy that book on the used book market. It, th this map is my impression of what it is, no one else's impression of what it is. The front line of these regiments are going to go into the wheat field here. This is around 5.30, so they're going to move from that bivouac over to the little round top area. And we're not exactly sure how they did that. They either did it using the Granite Schoolhouse Lane or they did it coming down the Blacksmith Shop Road. They've got two alternatives to do that. And that kind of plays into our story a little bit with Captain Sproul here in just a few moments. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where he ends up. And I think it's because he sees some of these places on the route of march. 4th Infantry would be where it says Day's Brigade stacked. Little round top at the bottom of the screen. We field off to the left. What's this look like today? It looks like this. Sedgwick Avenue right in front of you, Munshower Hill on your right, Little Round Top uh, on your left, where the Wheatfield Road is, and you are standing where the 4th United States Infantry Regiment was, close by, on July 2nd, 1863, before it goes into action into the Wheatfield. The Wheatfield, one of the most um, difficult places to interpret, many phases in it. This is toward the end phase of the wheat field that the regulars will make this approach on July 2nd. They will go in there basically to relieve John Cobwell's division of the 2nd Union Army Corps. So imagine you're standing here on July 2nd, 1863, and at around 6, 6.30, you're going to get moved forward to go to the stone wall that is at the base of the wheat field or on the east side of the wheat field. This is the same stone wall that Joshua Chamberlain's units, Vincent's brigade, was at before they went to Little Round Top. When this is going on, there's fighting at Little Round Top, there's fighting at Devil's Den, and Devil's Den is going to be taken by Confederate troops, and they're going to shoot at the Union troops that are in the regular division as they move across this field on July 2nd, 1863. So this is a reverse of that. So the red arrow is where I was just standing in the center of this picture. A little round top off to the right, Wheatfield Road, Munchower Hill, and this, this little marshy area right across uh, Bloody Run, Plum Run, right across that run, 
you're going to move to that position on the afternoon of July 2nd, 1863. My guess is it's probably around, uh, I don't know, 6.30, probably around that time that this all, all takes place. Here's what it looks like. Um, Sidney Burbank's brigade's in front. Here's all the regulars in the front. And the 4th Infantry are... Man, Captain Sproul, right here. Now, remember, he's not in command. He said he had a horse riding to the battlefield. I don't know whether he's got a horse in this action. But these units, here's the stone wall. We field today. We field road off over here to the right of the slide. These units are going to move into the wheat field, and the 4th Infantry is going to come right up to this stone wall right here. This is going to be their position around 7 o'clock. Now, meanwhile, who's coming down this road? The Confederate troops of Wofford's Brigade. So, all the Caldwell's men get shoved out, and now the regulars are going to get hit on the flank on the right. That's off over here at the top of the slide where my cursor is moving around up here by the Georgians, and then over here at Devil's Den, by the Georgians, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Texans, because I've got a good friend on here, Texas Brigade historian, and he would say, why didn't you mention them? So I'm going to throw them in. They're going to shoot at the left of, of the regulars that are here. Captain Sproul is right here with the 4th Infantry. He's a senior officer, not in command, and a rifle bullet, a spent ball, strikes him in the right fleshy part of the leg. And with these troops coming down the road that are Confederates, he is actually going to get cut off from the command along with several officers. Now, here's what, here's what he says. This is, this is his explanation of it in a personal statement. So he's fighting in the wheat field. He gets hit with a spent ball. It bruises his leg. Confederates are coming down the, uh, the wheat field road, and he gets shoved off and pushed back toward Little Round Top. Where does he go? Well, he says, after separation, I went to the Corps Hospital of the 3rd Corps, 3rd, and afterwards to the 11th Corps that's there. I think that this hospital is the Michael Fry Farm that is very close to George Spangler. This is it today. I'm going to go back a couple slides so you can see it. And here it is today where this building is along the Tawny Town Road in Granite Schoolhouse Lane. Lewis Duncan, who wrote a medical history of the Civil War, Talks about the field hospitals at Gettysburg. He has a map with the first third corps field hospital at the farm of Michael Fry. Now that's only about a half a mile from the George Spangler farm. Now if you're Captain Sproul, how do you know to get to these places? Because I think, ladies and gentlemen, you marched either on the Granite Schoolhouse Lane where my cursor is right here, or you came down here and marched along Blacksmith Shop Road. My guess is you came across the lane and down the Tawny Town Road. And what would have been there on July 2nd, the field hospital at the Michael Fry Farm. The George Spanger Farm is a field hospital on July 1st. How does Captain Sproul know where these places are? Because he's bivouacked right by them. Now, let's go back to this slide here. This is what Dr. Britton says. He says that he found out that Captain Sproul absenced himself from his command in the battle in the face of the enemy, and he wasn't is, in his opinion, what he says, insane. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about that because I don't think that's what the case is, but we'll talk a little bit. And then he says that he took him to General Howard of the 11th Corps. So, Captain Sproul, mentally exhausted, physically struck by a spent ball, spends the night of July 2nd at the Michael Fry farm, and then he goes to the George Spangler farm. And he is there for two days. And the George Spangler farm is the farm that is now owned by the Gettysburg Foundation. Here is the George Spangler farm. And this is where he is for a couple days. And this is what General Howard does for him. General Howard, Dr. Britton takes... Captain Sproul to General Howard. Why does he do that? Because Dr. Britton is a 11th Union Army Corps surgeon. This is the Corps commander of the 11th Union Army Corps. And guess what? General Howard knows William Sproul, knows Captain Sproul, 
How come? Because when did Howard graduate from West Point? 1854. And who is the minister at West Point in 1854? This man's father. So he says, for the sake of an old friend, Professor Sproul, why does he call him a professor? Because if you're the chaplain at the United States Military Academy in this period, you're also the professor of ethics. So he's the ethics professor as well. And so Howard gives Sproul a, letter, a note, basically, and says, I think that, you know, this person needs to be examined. And Sproul is supposed to take that and go to General Sykes, the commanding officer of the Fifth Army Corps. So this is the worst thing that you can do, ladies and gentlemen, at the time of the Civil War, absent yourself in the middle of a battle, which is exactly what this man did. Question is, why did he do it? Now, we know that Sproul, he says, tried to join his regiment, although he doesn't make it. He will go down to Baltimore, and he will go back to New York, so somehow this man has the where for all to go from the Gettysburg Battlefield on July 5th, 1863 to Newburgh, New York, where he arrives on July 9, 1863. He's up there on the 9th of July. One of the men that examines him before and knows him very well is Edward Swift Dunster. Now, full disclosure, Dr. Dunster is an Army surgeon in Washington, D.C., and he writes, even before the Battle of Gettysburg, that he wants this man's um, resignation, you know, he needs to be attended to, basically. This man becomes Captain Sproul's brother-in-law. How about that? Not only is he a doctor, in Captain Sproul's case, he's Captain Sproul's brother-in-law in November of 1863, right after this is written. He's engaged, this man is engaged to Sproul's sister. So, there is an entire case trying to figure out what happened to this man. Dr. Nathaniel Dio is his local surgeon. All these men believe that this man has some sort of mental health need. He has a mental health need. That's the words we would use today. And here are some possibilities. And I, I cannot tell you which one of these is true. I can only tell you what the evidence lends itself to, and without the help of my friend helping analyze this type of mental illness or mental health need, I would not have been able to come up with these things, but this is what we're looking at here. So here are the four educated guesses of Captain Sproul 157 years later. A man wounded in the wheat field by a spent ball, Back to the Michael Fry farm of the 3rd Corps, two days in the 11th Corps hospital, gets up to his home at West Point, and now he could be charged with misbehavior in the face of the enemy, he could be charged with desertion, there could be a number of things, and he, in, at least in his view, wants to resign out of the service and then later get reinstated. We'll talk a little bit about that. Did this man have a serious mental illness? I... The evidence shows he did not. He says he had hallucinations. Look, there are mental illnesses that can cause that. We know that, including schizophrenia. But that's not something that gets cured on his own. This man leads a productive life afterwards. Could he have been temporary deranged or have some sort of temporary insanity? I suppose it's possible, but not likely. And did he have a physical illness that somehow affected his actions? He was sick before the battle. I think that's pretty clear, at least physically. But did it um, affect his mental state? Nobody can know. I think that what actually happened down there on July 2nd is he was just plain scared. He'd not been in action before. Uh, and this is not me trying to sit in judgment. Let me tell you something. I'd have been the first guy off of that battlefield, I'm pretty certain, on July 2nd, 1863. I'm not trying to make any judgment calls here. But I don't believe the evidence lends itself that this man had a serious mental illness, one that would be lifelong, one that would be permanent, because he leads a productive life thereafter. He actually tries to get reinstated. So he tries to get put on the retirement list. The officers say, no way, you're not getting on the retirement list. Then he actually tries to resign, and his resignation is accepted on the 14th of July, 
1863. In 1864, he has an appeal that goes all the way up to the President of the United States to try to get reinstated. And Abraham Lincoln basically says, we are not going to re I'm not going to reinstate you because the position uh, was filled. So this man goes out of the service, and then he later tries to get reinstated. He doesn't get back in, so he becomes a teacher. And he later becomes a principal, and he becomes the principal of a public school in Brooklyn, New York. And that public school is still there uh, today. In 1904, almost 50 years after the Battle of Gettysburg, there is a fire in the public school where Spruill is the principal. And look what it says here in this newspaper article. Principal Spruill's a military man. Well, they got it wrong. He's not a graduate of West Point. But it says that he had the most effective fire drill of any school in the city, and they got 2,200 students out of a fire-ridden um, building, basically, on March 4, 1904, and they did that in three minutes. 2,200 students went out in the street, and they did it in three minutes. And according to the newspaper article, the students had had a fire drill the day before this fire, on March 3rd. And Spruill, who was an organized man, according to this, uh, was the last person out of, uh, of the building, according to what we know. We got a couple different reports of it. Here it is in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. And it says uh, that, that he was the last passenger and member of the school crew to pass into, streets, into the street. So is it possible he got scared in the Battle of Gettysburg on July 2nd, but yet he can get 2,200 students out of a building in Brooklyn, New York, and he can be the last person out of a, a, a building that's on fire? I guess it's possible. Here it is. Uh, why? I can't tell you why. But to me, it's a fascinating story. And today... In Brooklyn, New York, is the Samuel Mills Spruill School. There it is, right there. Still named for him. Uh, 100 and, 115 years uh, after his death in 1905. He dies about a year after this fire. This is the, the school. It's there today. You can go there today. And here's the place where he died. It's about a mile from the school in downtown Brooklyn, New York. I believe this is the original building. This is the address. He died of pneumonia on November 14, 1905. Officer in the Battle of Gettysburg. Here is his a grave up uh, at the... At, uh, this is in New Windsor, which is just south of Newburgh. This is a recent photograph of his grave where he died. And folks, I, I, you know, I just think we need to understand we don't have the whole story here and we're trying to come up with a reason for this officer's actions 157 years later. I don't believe, based on the evidence, it was a serious mental illness that put this man off the battlefield on July 2nd, 1863. Could have been, but I don't believe it is. Mental, Serious mental illness, mental illness of any kind, difficult to try to diagnose today, difficult to diagnose in the Civil War. As my friend would say, very little has changed in 157 years. There are people that fight in the American Civil War that have serious mental health needs after the Civil War is over. And there is very little work done on it. Um, a couple books out there, including Shook to Hell is one of them. Um, Marching Home, the one that was done... Uh, recently, but there's more work that needs to be done related to the mental health field and the mental health of soldiers of the Civil War. There's a whole story to be told there that I can't tell you today, and hopefully somebody will pick up that mantle, but if you're a historian, you better get some help through a mental health care professional to help you understand what you need to understand, because you're not going to fill that all in just being uh, a historian that's there. The regular army fought at Gettysburg. Here's an officer that fought there. It loses 20% of its men fighting in the Battle of Gettysburg. And when asked afterwards, Roman Ayers said that he had a division once. He buried half of them at Gettysburg and the rest of them he buried at the wilderness. And there were no regulars left. So when you tour the Battle of Gettysburg, anytime, don't just think about all these volunteer troops. Because in most cases, they're not around anymore. Unless... 
A National Guard unit has direct lineage to them, which in most cases is not the case. They might be named for them, but not the case. The regulars guarded us before the Civil War. They guarded us during the Civil War, and they're guarding us today. And we can't forget that, everyone on this call. I'm so honored, Bruce, that you asked me to be there, uh, be here, um, excuse me, be here with you this evening. I thank you so much for the time that I've been allowed here, and I'll try to take any questions. Thanks very much.